we're going to be all over the place because the Bible's a big book, and it covers a lot of it covers this in a lot of areas. In Psalms at chapter eighty-two, verse one, it says, "God standeth in the congregation of the mighty; He judgeth among the gods." I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. Talking about angels that left their first estate. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Jesus Christ right now is sitting on the right hand of the Father. We covered that in the last lesson I taught. He's prophet, priest, and he, right now he's our high priest sitting on the right hand of the Father, reconciling sinners to Christ. One day he'll be on the throne, and he'll rule and reign in righteousness. But for right now, we have to suffer. The world suffers because there's a curse on this earth. And that curse affects everybody that's ever been born of a woman. And it doesn't mean whenever you get sick that God did this to me. That's a misconception. What did this to people is sin. When Adam fell, there's a curse on this world. And that curse will not be taken off until the Lord Jesus Christ stepped foot on this, this planet and sits in the throne of David for a thousand years. As soon as man rebelled against God, dominion was turned over to Satan. And now he's the God of this world. Let's pray. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're going to be attacking Satan this morning. And Lord, I need your help. I'm nothing without you, Lord. My voice is absolutely nothing without the Holy Spirit speaking through me. Lord, let your word open up the ears and the eyes of the people that are sitting here and the people that are watching on the Internet. And let your name be lifted up and glorified in all things. For I ask you, Jesus Christ, amen. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, a lot of people associate that with about 100 years before the flood. But if you read the passage, the first verse, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. That had to be at the beginning, because you can't populate without women. That's a shock to a lot of people in the world today, because they think there's no difference between man and woman, but there is. that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took themselves wives, all of which they chose. And this was the beginning of sorrows for people on the earth. Now man could have said, okay, God, we got a problem. Please help us. And God would have stopped it. But man chose not to, to call out to God. They just let it take carry on and all these creatures were born on the face of the earth and they took over and God had to destroy the world, the world with a flood except for Noah and his three sons and their three daughter-in-laws and his wife eight souls on the, on the ark the first time God mentions or is talking to, to the nation of Israel he gives them ten commandments and these Ten Commandments, the first one is Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt make unto thee any, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is under the, 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 uh, under the earth. That's sea, earth, and air. 
If you go to Revel uh, Revelations chapter 13, where does the Antichrist come from? The Antichrist comes up out of the sea. The false prophet comes up out of the earth. And Lucifer, the dragon, comes up out of the air. So God was warning man ahead of time, be careful. There are things in this earth, there are things on this earth that want to destroy you, and you've got to be careful. If you, don't, if you stray away from me, you're at their mercy. And we see how close we are or far away we are from God and how close and how much power these, these entities have over everything. You say, well, I, I thought God was the God of this world. He is. He's the God. He's supreme God. He's, God sits on his throne. God has a plan. And that plan will be fulfilled. But part of that plan is to create a, a church to call out a people. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So if you don't believe, it's because your father, the devil, is keeping you from believing the word of God. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are things out there that want to destroy you. There are things out there that want to destroy your family. There are things out there that want to destroy your kids. These things are in control of the governments of this world. They're in control of the religions of this world. They're in control of your entertainment of this world. And if you study about entertainment, you would not go to a movie. You will not watch it on TV. And Walt Disney, you'd take all that stuff in, that's Walt Disney and throw it out because it's all demonic. Everything in this world other than the, the, the King James 1611 Bible that you hold in your hand is of the devil. I'm telling you. It's so, we, we've gotten so lax in this world that your church thinks that everything's okay and now we're sending our children to hell because we're not smart enough to, to investigate and find out what is right and what is wrong. Amen. In Psalms chapter 2 verse 1 it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He, God, has set in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Confusion. Boy, are we confused today. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in the sore displeasure. So why does not God do that right now? Why doesn't God just destroy everything? I mean, if I was God, I would do that. I don't have much patience with people. I get mad. I'm angry all the time because of what this world is doing to this world, to our children. But I'm not God. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, this is who God is. He proclaims it to Moses. 
And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. This is God proclaiming. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sin, that, and that will by no means clear the guilty. You deny God, God will deny you. He loves us so much that he's long-suffering. He doesn't want any of us to perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, or promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That means you that had been coming to church for here, here for years and years and years and have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God is long-suffering, and he's not willing for you to perish. And when he says in your ear, what about today? You can be saved today. God says, what about tomorrow? What about the next day? But there is an end to his wooing. We get so desensitized to it that we think, well, I know all the lingo of the Baptist church, and I know all the lingo of this church, and I know exactly what to say. But in your heart, you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord wants for us as Christians, he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he says, but the fruit of of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And this church is, I want to commend this church for the support you're giving my wife. I appreciate it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For, while, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand the, wild, the evil day and having... Done all to stand. And when you list these seven armors of God, the first one he says, stand therefore. The first thing you have to learn in the Christian life is how to stand. When you're um, in the military, when you're in martial arts, when you're in boxing, whenever you're learning to fight, you have to learn how to stand. When you're shooting some weapons that are pretty good size, you have to learn how to stand or you're going to get knocked down. Having your loins girded about with truth. You know how important that is? Because when you're boxing or fighting anything, you've got to have a strong core. And the Bible says to, to gird up your loins with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, the first thing you do is you get truth, you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you get that breastplate. That's the Holy Spirit. He comes in and dwells within you. And then you get your feet sodded in the preparation of the, of the gospel of peace. That means you get a firm foundation and you're able to stand and you're not easily knocked down. That's why it's so important to read and study your word, the word of God. Look at this. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Man, is that important. You know, Paul, he was with these Roman soldiers for a long time, and he was, he was studying these Roman soldiers, and, he, and wherever a soldier goes, he has to take his, his equipment with him. So he had, they had their shields, they had their swords, they had their helmet, they had their breastplate, they had their loins girded, they had their feet sodded, and they were ready for anything. If they were called up right then, they, they're ready to go. Paul was studying these soldiers, and he noticed that shield. And a Roman shield would come up to about right here on a Roman soldier. And that shield, he could block any blows that were coming towards him. But he had, but his head was vulnerable. So he said, you know, he had that helmet. Man, that's, that's just like God. A lot of us don't have a shield. A lot of us don't have helmets. A lot of us have never sodded our feet and we're vulnerable, vulnerable to the enemy. But with a sword and a helmet and the shields and the, and the breastplate, you've got to have a weapon. These are offensive weapons or defensive weapons, but you have, an, have to have an offensive weapon. And the Romans were geniuses when it came to warfare. Their enemies all had these big old swords that they wielded around, you know, and hacked and chopped and everything. But the Roman soldiers, they had a short little sword about that long, about the size of a big bowie knife. And they would get up there and they would put that, they'd get in a line and they would go, they'd put that shield up and they'd take that, that little sword and they would, Every time they'd take a step in battle, they would whoo, whoo. And that was the most effective way of battling in that day. It was just like the atomic bomb is today. They couldn't defend against it. You had all these barbarians out there, just wild men, thinking, you know, good old boys out there with swords. But this was a disciplined army. They knew how to use their armor. They knew how to use their weapons. And they were effective. Every time we go to battle with the world, let me tell you something. I respect these guys that get out there on the streets and preach. Let me tell you something. That is a hard thing to do. But they got to prepare themselves beforehand. Because if they're not right with the Lord, they'll, they won't be effective. If they don't know how to use their sword, they're not going to be effective. But the first thing that any sinner will do, will he'll, he'll say, well, if God's in control, why hasn't he done anything yet? If I'm sinning, why hasn't God punished me already? Because he's long-suffering. He wants you to come to repentance. Well, if God is the God of this world, why is it in such a mess? Because God is not on his throne. But when he's on his throne, it'll be too late for you if you don't receive him now. We live in a, in a world of misinformation. God is not, Jesus Christ is not on his throne. He's on the right hand of the Father, reconciling us to Christ. He's our mediator between us and God. Whenever we sin, God says, what about this guy over here? He's on my list. It's already been paid for. Don't worry about it. It's covered with my blood. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, For the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. You got an alcohol problem? You got a drug problem? 
you got a perversion problem, whatever problem you got can be taken to the Lord. And some of it takes fasting and praying because that's the, that's the next thing we get to. Praying always with prayers and supplications in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perverseness and supplication for all saints. That means we pray for each other. That means that we fast for each other. That means that we give time for our brethren in prayer. These enemies are strong, but God is stronger. Greater is, in, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you don't believe that, then you need to get on your knees and ask Jesus Christ to come to your heart and save you, and you'll have that power. But without it, you're subject to anything. The biggest thing you can, the best thing you can do when you pray, you got to ask for wisdom, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Learn as much about Him as you can. Two, ask for knowledge. Knowledge is is a good weapon. And this is what the church is, needs really, really, really bad is discernment. Amen. Discern the spirits. Test it with the word of God. Don't accept everything. Amen. But God has a timetable. We find that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. It says, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing where, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by the water. God allowed Noah to preach for 120 years or 100 years until the ark was finished. That ark was not built for animals. You say, oh, wow, you're getting stretchy there. No, it was built for those who would hear and receive. God could have recreated the animals anytime he wanted to. But when man rejected God's word, then God brought the animals aboard. That was the last thing he did because he was hoping that somebody would receive the message of Noah. But only his three sons, three daughters, daughter-in-laws, and his wife. This time's running out. Christians that are that are sinning right now, they say, well, you know, I don't see anything wrong with what I'm doing because God has not, never talked to me about it. Well, there's a thing called forbearance in the Bible. That means God tolerates your sin, hoping that you'll get right with him. When you cast somebody out of the church for something that they've done and you church them and then you see that, well, their lives are fine. They're, they're getting along fine. And God says, don't, don't worry about it. You did what was right, but I love that person. And my forbearance is hoping that they'll get right and come back. You find this in uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Oh, the, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Jesus Christ is on the right hand of God. You find this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22 says, Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. The churches have lied to the, to the world and said, Jesus Christ is on his throne. He's coming back. He's not on his throne yet. He's reconciling sinners to Christ. That's why you're saved. 
because of his long suffering. He says, well, if I come back right now, a thousand years ago, where would we be? If he came back 500 years ago, where would we be? If we came, he'd come back 100 years ago, I wouldn't have been here. Some of you might have been. Well, I don't know how your age is. But his long suffering is that he wants all that will come into the, to his kingdom to come in. So he's delaying his wrath until the time when he tells his son, get your bride. And that's the first sign to the world, the wrath is coming. You better get right. And you'll, the world will have seven years to repent. But when Jesus Christ gets on his throne, and there's two thrones that Jesus Christ has. There's the throne of David, which will last for a thousand years. And I better take my watch off because I'll probably <laughs> go beyond the time because this I got 14, 15 pages and I only make eight at the, at the most. But when, when Jesus Christ returns... When he sits on the throne of David, that will be for a thousand years. And he'll rule with a rod of iron. He'll rule uh, nations that hate him, that despise him. And people say, well, well, I think America is going to make it. I learned this week that, that America is not going to make it. Spain's not going to make it. Germany's not going to make it. God's going to destroy them all. We'll get to that hopefully. If not, just ask me later and I'll show you the verse. But we're, we are a contrary people. We get right with the Lord, we, go, we, we rebel against him. The Jews did it for years. And every time God had his arms open, waiting to receive Israel back as a nation because of his long suffering. People say, well, you know, God gave me cancer. No, he didn't. God never gave you nothing other than Jesus Christ. God gave me different diseases. God never gave nothing bad. In James chapter 1, verse 17, says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from heaven the Father of lights, with whom is no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. Amen. God gives nothing but good stuff to us. And he promises he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So when you get sick and you, you're, you're suffering, remember, God is there. God will carry you through it. God will take care of you because you're one of his. God puts a hedge of protection around all of our children and all our families. But you know what we do? God puts this big old protection, the devil can't get in, he's mad. But you know what we do? We start hacking away at that hedge. And we start opening up gateways. Amen. Then the devil has a straight path right to us. And next thing you know, families are destroyed. Drugs, alcohol. And you wonder why? Because there are things out there that want to destroy you, and you've got to keep that armor on, and you've got to keep that hedge up, and you've got to discern, especially with young people, you've got to discern about everything that's going on, starting with when they're born, all the way up to the time that they leave the home. And then... When you send your children off to college, that's probably the worst thing you can do other than a Christian college because when that child gets into these colleges, these professors who are controlled by these principalities and powers and entities are going to convince your kids that God doesn't exist and it's all a lie. And, that, and these kids are so naive 
They're paying thousands of dollars out to be educated, and they're being educated out of believing in God. So when you send your child off, you can pray all you want, but I can talk to, I can tell you a, a list of families that I know that have sent their kids off to college, and they won't even, when they come to visit, they won't, don't talk about God to me. I've been educated. I don't believe in that foolishness no more. These principalities and powers are strong. They're powerful. And most church, most families do not teach their kids how to, to, to uh, defend against these things. I believe, personally, that whenever our pastor's up here teaching about things that's going on in this world, you should have your kids in here listening to this stuff. Because they're not going to get into Sunday school. We need to be educated about these principalities and powers that are trying to destroy us. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel's given a, a, a vision. And Daniel says, Lord, I, I want, he prays and asks the Lord to give him the interpretation of this vision. And Daniel's, Daniel doesn't get anything. And he's fasting. He fasts for 21 days and he goes, whew, you know, I'm hungry. I'm getting weak. Lord, help me. Answer my prayers. But look what he says in chapter, verse 12. He says, when the, when, the, when the angel finally comes, he says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. We want an immediate answer to everything. We are instantaneous society. We don't believe in waiting for anything. But the prince, verse 13 says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief Princes came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. And now I am come to make thy understanding, thy, thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. And then in verse 20, it talks about the prince of Grecia shall come. So if this is true, then all these nations around the world have their own little demon that's ruling and reigning over that nation. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves that's the problem we have today. Everyone's so proud. Everyone's so patriotic. Everyone's this and that. When are people going to get serious about God? When you look at the United States, one, one time the United States was considered a righteous nation because we believed in God. Our churches preached fervently. Thousands and thousands would get saved when revival would hit America. But all that's over with now. The only revival we're going to get is little teeny bitty itty bitty revivals because we're in the gleaming stage right before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. You know, I was studying my Bible, you know, and I was looking at the new, these other translations and something hit me. I said, you know, Society, when the King James Bible was written, it was in King's English. It was considered perfect Shakespearean English. Way up here. And then as society started declining, they said, well, we need to rewrite that Bible so that the depraved can understand it. So the Bible got a little lower. And then 
the society moved down a little bit more. And they said, well, we're going to have to rewrite it again because it's offending too many people. So they lowered the standards, lowered, took out words, took out the power. And then as, as they go on and on and on, look what we got today. Most of these Bibles, you can't even find sin in it any longer. They don't, most people don't even believe in the rapture anymore because they've changed the Bible so much that rapture is not even in there. They don't have the blessed hope. You know, we talk about deep state, but there's a deeper, deeper state that we don't even know about, most people don't know about. We blame everything on Illuminati and the, and the Masons and everything, but they're just the puppets. The real people in control, you wouldn't even allow in your house. You'd be scared to death of. They want to see you dead. They're your enemy. That's who's running the world today. Look at China. You know, there's so many leaders out there wanting worship. The emperor of China wants worship. The uh, president of Turkey wants worship. The... the uh, Syrian government wants worship. EU wants to eradicate Christianity completely. The, everybody's wanting worship. They don't want you to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They want you to loot, uh, worship Lucifer. The other day, the, the Pope was in Poland, and he says he, uh, he addressed himself as, I am Lucifer. And he started laughing it off, but he was serious. That's where we've come to. All these entities are not afraid of being identified anymore because the people have been dumbed down and stupid and delusional. They don't know nothing anymore. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, the pastor quotes this verse all the time. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violence taken by force. But these entities that are out there cannot go beyond a certain point. God has a line drawn for them. They can't go beyond a certain point. And that line is you. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says, talking about angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. They watch over us. They help us. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar got up and decided he was the head of gold and he was so proud of himself and all the, all the kingdom that he had built and he was so proud of it and he was exalting himself. But... In verse 16 it says, these watchers and these holy ones that are watching over us and guarding where Satan goes and how far he can go, he says, let his heart be changed from a man and let a beast be given, un be given unto him and let seven times pass over him. Verse 17 says, this manner is a decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and given it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. These watchers are ruling, are watching to make sure that these demons and these principalities and powers don't cross a line. That's why we can still have church today. That's why we're, we still have freedom in America today is because God, by the testimony of these watchers, are saying, hold them back a little while longer. I'm about ready to take my bride home, but you've got to hold them back. There might be one more out there that's going to receive Jesus Christ as a, 
personal Savior, so you've got to hold them back. Elisha had an army, a massive army, surround his house. And his servant, Elisha, he wasn't worried. You'll find this in Second uh, Kings chapter 6. He wasn't worried. And his servant's going, oh, my goodness, we're going to die. You know, what are we going to do? And he says, hey, chill out. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. Verse 16, his servant wasn't too happy, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And you know, you look at this, and of course in 17 it says, The Lord opened his eyes, of the young man and he saw and behold the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisa. Whenever you study about the Israeli wars from 1948, 1967, 1973, Yom Kippur War, they all have something in common. Whenever they captured Large amounts of Arabs. The Arabs were running for their lives. They were scared to death. They were in a panic. Some of them would run so fast that they'd run out of their shoes and they jumped out of their tanks and they left their artillery and they, they just hightailed it. And they were so thirsty and hungry and stuff that it, uh, two lonely Israeli soldiers captured about 3,000 Arabs, e Egyptians. And they started questioning these men about why you're in such a panic. You're winning. And they said the same thing that's in the book of Elijah. The mountains were covered with these men in shining armor and fire. And he says, we were, we were scared. And that was testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony. So don't fear man. Put your fear in God. God is going to protect you. God is going to keep you. God is going to save you. And I only got a few minutes, but there is another throne. And the, this throne comes at the very end. And it's found in Revelation chapter 22. And this is probably the most mysterious throne that you'll ever read. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, it says, after all the, the thousand-year reign, after the, the white throne judgment, God, Jesus Christ, is given his final throne for all eternity. And that throne, and there shall be no more curse, thank God. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. They sit on the same throne. His redemption is over with. His plan is complete. And now God, Jesus Christ, sits on the throne of God with God. That's amazing. Jesus Christ was taken to a high mountain by Lucifer during the, in the wilderness. And Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, if you see all this, I'll give it to you. All you have to do is get down and worship me. Jesus Christ said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Get away from me, Satan. Before Jesus Christ ever come down to this, this earth, God the Father told the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll go down there and take care of that sin problem and redeem those people and reconcile a people to me, I'll give you all, the, all these nations. I'll give you the whole entire thing. And you won't have to bow down to nobody.
And that's what Jesus Christ did. He came down. He was victorious. He died on the cross for our sins. And you know what? I was thinking about this when the pastor was talking about that time when, when the, Jesus Christ looked up into heaven and says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I thought for a second. God couldn't look on him because he was seeing me. He was seeing you. God couldn't look on us at that time. He couldn't see the son for all the sin that he was bearing on himself. He was bearing us on the cross. And then when he came off that cross, he didn't take the sins with him. He nailed them to the cross and left them there. Now when Jesus Christ, or God looks at, looks at me, he doesn't see Dave Valance. He sees the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And your problem is, if you haven't received him as your Savior, is God can't look at you. God doesn't even know who you are. Let's pray. Our dear Father, Lord, I pray that this message will resonate through the hearts of men. Lord, I thank you for being so good to me. Lord, there's people in this house right now that need prayer. There's people that need to come forward and, and be saved, Lord, but Lord, you're the, you're the one that gives the increase, not me. We just water and we sow. There's people in this house today that are sick, that need healing. And Lord, I pray for those people that have that need healing, Lord, I pray that you'll heal them. And I pray, Lord, that you'll, your name, your word, you'll get all the glory, not anyone in this house. Lord, guard our service. Give our pastor liberty as he preaches. Let the Holy Spirit have dominion in this place. Let our ears be open and our eyes be open and let us receive what you have for us, Lord, and apply it to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to die for us. Thank you for that blessed hope that we have that you're coming back for us soon. For we ask in the name of the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.